There you go, Nathan, you should be good. All right, can everyone see my screen in presentation mode? Yep, yep, it's looking perfect. All right, well, thank you, Aaron, for hosting me, and I'm very excited today to talk about how our lab, uh, the lab of Dr. Stefan Wilhelm at the University of Oklahoma, in collaboration with Perkin Elmer, I'm going to talk about how we developed a new elemental analysis technique to quantify nanoscale interactions with single nanoparticle resolution and how we can quantify the composition and reaction kinetics of individual nanoparticles. Ultimately, this work has the potential to transform our understanding of nanotechnology to facilitate the translation of new nanomaterials for the safe and efficacious use of nanotechnology in all different areas. So, with that, I just want to give a brief introduction about nanotechnology and some of the parameters we have to consider when we're applying it, and then talk more about this study. Okay, let me advance the slide. So when we talk about nanotechnology, it's important to know how small we're actually talking about. And this is just a scale to orientate ourselves. And I apologize for everyone who already knows this, but it's just really good to make sure that everyone is on the same level. So at first it can be hard to comprehend how small the nanoscale is because it's just so much smaller in our everyday experience. It's interesting to note that an average human hair is around 60,000 to 100,000 nanometers wide and objects of this small dimension have significantly different properties of materials at the larger scale. So as you can see in this note we have protein, DNA, and viruses. Those are natural examples of nano size materials. So as engineers and scientists we can use this scale to make our own types of materials and apply them in different settings. Typically they're broken down into these three different domains where you have organic nanoparticles, biologic based nanoparticles, or inorganic nanoparticles, and they all can be fine-tuned to have different applications. Organic nanoparticles are very commonly used to deliver biological materials like in the COVID vaccines that we have, they're lipid nanoparticles. Biologics such as potentially exosomes or as, uh, viral based nanoparticles are used also for delivering biologics. And then today's talk will be mostly focusing on inorganic nanoparticles like gold nanoparticles or silver nanoparticles or even bimetallic nanoparticles. And these bimetallic nanoparticles are very useful for diagnostics or even catalysis and also useful in photonics. So now that we have a better understanding of the nanoscale and what we're actually working with, I just wanna give a quick overview of what is really important in the design parameters that we have to consider when we're actually formulating and using these types of nanoparticles. Oops. So one of the main parameters of nanotechnology is that the properties that we design our nanoparticles with, they actually get, govern the function of our nanoparticles. So here are just four simple but very important characteristics of nanoparticles that we need to consider when we're formulating and using our nanoparticles in, in for whatever application. Size is a huge important is a really important factor for formulating nanoparticles in that it can affect its distribution, its diffusion through a substance, and it can also affect its uh, optical properties as well. So size is a one of the, probably the most important parameters as well as the considering how important that is to the surface to area volume ratio. Secondly, colloidal stability is directly involved with size, and we have to be able to have colloidally stable nanoparticles or not colloidally stable nanoparticles, and as a no, what this stability of our nanoparticles are to have an effective use of our nanoparticles. And today I'll also be talking about composition of nanomaterials. And here's just an example of how you can have a gold, pure gold nanoparticle, a pure silver nanoparticle, or a gold silver alloy. And it's just not limited to gold and silver. You can have many different types of metals um, like platinum or palladium and things like that. So composition affects magnetic properties, optical properties, and can also affect toxicity. And likewise, which I won't be talking about today, is charge of a nanoparticle and the surface charge and how we can manipulate the surface charge to have a desired outcome or effect. So these properties are all important and it's crucial for us as scientists and engineers to characterize these and characterize them with high throughput and almost with single particle resolution to get a better understanding of the distribution and the actual properties of these individual nanoparticles. However, since nanoparticles are so small, it's actually very difficult to characterize these simultaneously and with single particle resolution in a fast manner. So when we look, talk about nanoparticle characterization, we have these conventional techniques that actually have drawbacks. So one of the primary 
techniques for looking at nanoparticle size and perhaps colloidal stability is light scattering. So light scattering, like dynamic light scattering, is typically done batch-based and it measures the hydrodynamic radius. So we're not actually getting an absolute size of our nanoparticle. We're getting a layer of hydration around our nanoparticles. There's also spectrophotometry that is also batch-based, meaning that we're not getting single particle heterogeneity. We're not looking at individual nanoparticles. And spectrophotometry like UV-VIS requires that nanoparticles be optically active and that they absorb in some wavelength of light. But that's not the case for all nanoparticles, which makes it difficult. And lastly, there's my microscopy. Typically, electron microscopy is used to characterize the size in, of nanoparticles. And I'll be talking at length of how we use microscopy in conjunction with ICPMS. However, one of the drawbacks of microscopy is that it requires nanoparticle preparation, and that can be pretty challenging. So another facet of this nanoparticle preparation is that it's done ex situ, so it's not done in the nanoparticles native environment since you have to deposit these nanoparticles onto a grid. And on top of that, with microscopy, nanoparticle sizing analysis requires image analysis, and that can be time consuming as well. So it is low throughput, it is time and labor intensive, and although it is single particle resolution, so that's one of the strong suits of electron microscopy. An ideal technique would enable all of these different facets to be incorporated into one technique. So something that is high throughput, like the batch-based methods, it would be in situ, meaning that we don't need to do much nanoparticle preparation, and it would still maintain single particle resolution. And these are all essential, again, for the effective and safe application of nanotechnology. So what is this ideal technique? Uh, and this is the crux of today's talk that we're talking to you today about, which is single particle inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. And so I want to introduce this technique and talk about how we applied this to start looking at bimetallic nanoparticles and also reaction kinetics. So here is the University of Oklahoma's ICPMS, and this is with its single particle configuration. So first, and I'll just walk you through how single particle ICPMS is performed, and then we'll go into how dual analyte is er, performed as well. So first, we have a microfluidics sample introduction as shown here in this image, denoted by the number one. This sample introduction system operates at a flow rate of around 10 microliters per minute, and this allows us to introduce samples into the ICPMS. And so at once the samples are introduced into, or to get to the samples to be introduced into the ICPMS, they are nebulized to create an aerosol. And as denoted in this number two, these samples are introduced into the argon plasma as aerosol droplets. And with this system, they're gently introduced into the plasma as single nanoparticles that they're colloidally stable solutions that are introduced into the plasma. And this plasma temperature is at around 6,000 Celsius, which atomizes and ionizes samples forming singly charged ions. And so that's denoted here. And this is a very useful uh, animation to depict that process. As you have these gray dots entering the mass spectrometer, they enter the plasma, they form this ion plume. And this ion plume is something we'll be talking about in a couple more slides. And that ion plume is something that gets moved and manipulated through the instrument to reach a detector. And that detector then allows us to measure the intensity of these ion plumes, which with our software, with Perkin Elmer software, we can compare the intensities of measured pulses to those from standards to determine nanoparticle mass. And essentially, this is all of what single particle ICPMS is. Again, just to recap, we have a microfluidic system that gently introduces our nanoparticles into the plasma. They're atomized and ionized in this argon plasma. And then with an ion optic system, we're able to then quantify the intensity and the masses of these nanoparticles. And this can be performed at a rate of over 300 particles per minute. So again, we're essentially pushing forward in that very fast single particle resolution high throughput technique. So this instrument uses a quadrupole based mass filter. And I want to introduce what the quadrupole does as opposed to something like a time of flight mass spectrometer. So here is just a quick diagram of quadrupole mass filtering. So in this pink, in this diagram, you can see a pink arrow entering this cell or this chamber. And this pink, it, this pink line denotes ions. And so you can have multiple different ions. You could have gold, silver, platinum, whatever. So you have your ion stream entering this quadrupole mass filter. Based on the voltages of these quadrupole rods, your 
selecting and filtering out everything else that you don't want to analyze. So in this example, let's assume that we're looking at gold nanoparticles and we're only going to want to look at gold. So if we apply that voltage for the quadrupole ions to remove and filter out everything, we're only going to be looking at red or gold atoms going through this quadrupole. So based on the settings of this quadrupole, we're only allowed to look at one isotope at a time, whereas the other isotopes, they have an unstable ion trajectory and they're ejected from the mass spectrometer. So we're not able to look at them. Yes, this is very efficient and it's very cost effective as opposed to something like a time of flight mass spectrometer, but this limits our analysis to only looking at one isotope at a time. And for a single particle, we may have multiple elements in our particle solution or multiple elements within our nanoparticle themselves. So we really need to work around this one isotope limit uh, with quadrupole mass spectrometry. So again, quadrupole filters actually prohibit the dual analysis. So here's an example of an example of a gold nanoparticle and a, a bimetallic nanoparticle with both gold and silver. So if we introduce them to our argon ICPMS, we're going to get a, this transient ion plume. And so for the top row, we're going to get a transient ion plume of all gold atoms that last on the duration of microseconds. And on the bottom panel, we have a bimetallic nanoparticle again. It's going to form an ion plume, but we're going to have both gold and silver at the same time. And when we throw them through our quadrupole, or when they pass through the quadrupole, and we're only looking at, we're only able to look at one element at a time, we're going to end up ejecting all the silver atoms and only look at gold. So again, this is a limitation that needs to be overcome to enable the quantification of composition of nanoparticles and especially bimetallic or multi-element nanoparticles. So this is a diagram of the Nexion 2000, which was used in the study. And so this is a just a brief diagram of what's actually happening in our ICPMS and how we can actually overcome this limitation. So first, our again, our sample is atomized and ionized. Our nanoparticle sample is atomized and ionized in this argon plasma, and it's focused into an ion beam. Next, the photons and neutrals are removed with the quadrupole ion deflector. And singly charged ions are then passed into our the rest of the mass spectrometer. And this is where we're going to start able to analyzing more than one element per nanoparticle at a time. And it's done systematically. I just want to walk you through the steps so you can understand the procedure. So the first step of our nanoparticles journey to overcome this quadrupole limit is to stretch or increase the duration time of our nanoparticles signals in the collision cell. And that's denoted with this first green arrow. So once our nanoparticles are passing through the mass spectrometer, they're in this, this chamber called the reaction collision cell. What we can do is we can fill that reaction collision cell with a gas like ammonia. And I'll talk more in detail about how ammonia interacts with our nanoparticle cells, but we can adjust the pressure and the gas flow of ammonia, as well as something called axial field technology voltage that enables the passage of our ions through this collision cell. And we can actually elongate those nanoparticle transient ion clouds to last not microseconds, but actually milliseconds. And that's the first step to overcoming the quadrupole's limitation. The next step is to actually adjust the quadrupole itself. And we can, quadrupoles are very efficient at switching between masses, and they're very efficient in batch based modes to switch between multiple isotopes in the sample very quickly and very efficiently. So, what we can do with our Nexion 2000 in the nano application module is that we can actually manually adjust the quadrupole settling time, something that I'll talk a little bit more about, um, that we can actually efficiently filter between two different isotopes within a single nanoparticle event. And then we're able to send those ions from an individual nanoparticle, those two different isotopes, to our detector. And the last step for overcoming the quadrupole's one isotope limit is to detect these ion signals as fast as possible. And to do that, you need to utilize microsecond detector dwell times. So this is an overview of what's actually happening inside the ICPMS and how this dual analyte process is done. I just want to go over that again with a little more depth. So again, we let's assume we have a nanoparticle that is a multi-elemental nanoparticle denoted by this blue and green signal. Again, we have our argon ICP that, again, atomizes and ionizes it. And we have this initial ion cloud that lasts maybe 100 microseconds. or a, probably about 500 microseconds or 600 or 700, and that's dependent upon the size of our nanoparticle. So again, we have this initial ion cloud that's very short lasting. We then, again, introduce it into our reaction cell that is filled with ammonia. 
And so this ammonia interaction with our nanoparticle ions, that actually allows us to reduce the kinetic energy of our nanoparticles traveling through the ICPMS. And what we can also do is we can apply axial field technology voltage to increase that length. So there's an interplay between the ammonia gas flow and this AFT voltage that we can play with to have an, a coherent ion beam that's actually stretched and uh, increased in time. So once these once this ion cloud leaves our reaction cell, we have something called a stretched ion cloud. So the signal, the intensity does decrease a bit, but we have a longer signal. And we're able to, again, optimize our ammonia gas flow and our AFT voltage to get the optimized stretched ion cloud. Then we have to optimize the quadrupole mass filter again to have efficient switching between our two analytes of interest. And again, we can manually optimize and adjust the quadrupole settling time. And that settling time is a specific amount of time that the quadrupole needs to equilibrate after switching from one M over Z value to another for optimal isotope filtering. And we are able to systematically change this so that we can ensure that two different isotopes from an individual transient nanoparticle ion cloud reach the detector for accurate quantification. And that's shown here. And Again, we're detecting these ions with microsecond detector dwell times, which has been shown in the literature to have enabled the accurate quantification of single isotopes. And now we're quantifying two isotopes at the same time from a single transient nanoparticle ion cloud. And moreover, with these microsecond detector dwell times, we're able to reduce the probability of incorrectly measuring overlapping nanoparticle clouds for a given concentration of nanoparticles. So. This is what dual analyte is essentially doing, is again, we're stretching our nanoparticle ion clouds, we're filtering them very quickly through our quadrupole mass filter, and then we're detecting our ions as fast as possible. So you may be wondering, okay, well, if you're able to do this, how can you efficiently quantify or track the number of isotopes reaching the detector at the same time? And that's for future notice, that's determined as a paired event. So what is a paired event? As you can see in this uh, this image here, the blue and the green signals with those lines, that would be considered a paired event as they're hitting the detector with three consecutive pulses and they're being paired by the software together. So that may be a little bit confusing, but as we're going forward, it will hopefully become more clear and crystallize, but this is a paired event. And so what we're going to do now is now determine how efficient is this quadrupole mass spectrometer at pairing events from a single transient ion cloud, and then we're going to apply that into nanoparticles. So here is just a quick uh, overview of our efficiency in terms of pairing. So this describes, uh, well, the diagram on the bottom left is an equilibration bead. It's a polymer bead that consists of different isotopes of cerium, lutetium, europium, and holmium. And what we did is we determined, okay, if we're not stretching our transient nanoparticle ion peaks, how efficient is this pairing process? How efficient are these signals reaching the detector at the same time? And without pairing, we're getting very low pairing efficiency. So these events aren't getting correctly paired. We know that they're, these isotopes are coming from the same particle, but without these longer transient ion peaks, we're not getting efficient measuring of both isotopes at the same time. So as you can see, the transport efficient or the the pairing of efficiency was around 50%, and for lutetium and holmium, it was around 40%. However, when we optimize that peak stretching condition with our collision cell, we're able to increase the, the pairing efficiency up to 97% for these, for these particles. And this has not been achieved yet with quadrupole ICPMS, especially for these beads. And we wanted to compare how efficient this dual analyte ICPMS protocol was when you compare it to a standard multi-element techniques such as time of flight mass spectrometry where you efficiently measure multiple elements at the same time so that is the standard that we are trying to compare against and we ran these same equilibration beads on mass spectrum or time of flight mass spectrometry and as you can see with mass spectrometry you get nearly 100 percent pairing events but with our quadrupole icpms which is definitely more cost effective and more economical to use, we're able to get similar pairing efficiencies as you would with a much more expensive and high-end instrument. So this was really encouraging for us to see that this technique is able to efficiently simultaneously detect two different isotopes from the same particle. So with this information, we're, we want, again, we're not looking just at polymer beads, we're 
really interested in looking at nanoparticles and seeing how we can quantify their composition and potential changes in their composition. So the next step was for us to determine how efficient and how quickly can we actually measure nanoparticle signals. So as a model system, we used 100 nanometer silver nanoparticles. And the great thing about silver is that it consists naturally of two isotopes that occur in around 50% uh, abundance. So we have silver 107 and silver 109. And so when we introduce these silver nanoparticles into the ICVMS, you can see here that the green would be one isotope. Then you have a time where the quadrupole is switching or equilibrating, which is known as the settling time. And then it measures the next isotope. And then you settle again, then you have a dwell time where you measure the next isotope and so forth. So if we have two silver nanoparticles, this is ideally what we should see. And as we increase concentration, we should be able to find a limit to how fast we can actually analyze nanoparticles. And so as you can see here, we adjusted the concentration of our nanoparticles that we were introducing into the system while simultaneously measuring silver 107 and silver 109. And with an increase in particle concentration up to around 500,000 particles per milli, you could see that we're decreasing our paired events, meaning that there's many multiple signals overlapping one another and the software can't distinguish between what is a single particle event and what is an actual um, paired event. So we determined with this data that we're able to, it's safe to estimate that around 100,000 particles per mil that you're effectively reducing your overlapping events and that you're getting over 97% or 95% pairing events of these two isotopes that are coming from the same nanoparticle. So this allowed us to determine how fast we were able to analyze our nanoparticle solutions. The next thing we also wanted to confirm is, well, if we have two different isotopes from pure nanoparticles, how can we determine what would be a false positive paired event? You know, these two particles ideally should remain not paired by the software. So the signals from these nanoparticles the three consecutive pulses should be separate and the software should be able to distinguish that they're two independent distinct nanoparticles. As you can see here, so the first event would be a pure gold nanoparticle with no silver. The second event would be a pure silver particle with no gold. And what you can see is as we increase particle concentration, we're still able to get, if we mix these particles in a one-to-one -one concentration and we measure the gold and silver at the same time and also measure paired events, you can see as we increase particle concentration, we get an increase in pairing events, which are false positive events. We want to be able to know that when we are starting to quantify these different isotopes and these different masses that we're below this false positive pairing event so that we're accurately doing single particle ICPMS. And as you can see, as is also confirmed with the silver particles, is that around 100,000 particles per mil is your ideal scenario and your ideal particle concentration to remain below this false positive event threshold. So with 100,000 particles per mil, our flow rate and our transport efficiency, which is around 40%, we're able to measure around 300 particles per minute. And so that is a, and we're able to measure both isotopes uh, at that rate as well. So that's important to know. And with this, now that we can detect these isotopes and we have the optimal sample conditions, the next step was to actually start quantifying how much of each isotope would be within a given nanoparticle. So as a model system, we used our silver nanoparticles. We synthesized four different sizes of our silver nanoparticles, and we measured the mass of both silver 107 and silver 109. And as you can see in this table, that the silver 107 and silver 109 masses are pretty close to each other and that their distributions, again, for over 300 events collected within one minute, yes, they are broad, but this is a good confirmation to show that we can quantify down to around 30 nanometers of a silver nanoparticle and upwards of 100 nanometers in terms of a silver particle. Our limit of detection was 30 nanometers due to the, the, the signal from our 30 nanometer particles was not high enough above the baseline, three sigma, three sigma standard deviations above the background to enable robust and accurate quantification. So that would probably be a limit. And that needs to be considered when you're trying to perform dual analyte is that limit of detection. So with silver nanoparticles where your isotopes are split between 107 and 109 in a 50% abundance, our limit of detection was around 30 nanometers for these types of nanoparticles. However, we're still able to obtain the accurate mass of them. And with that, knowing the mass of our nanoparticles, we can then start getting more information about the size 
of these nanoparticles. And so I also want to introduce uh, the nanoparticle mass and size distribution information that we're able to acquire with this technique. So in the Perkin Elmer's nanoparticle or nano application module, when you run a nanoparticle sample, you actually get this distribution plot of two isotopes. Uh, so on the x-axis, you have silver 107 in atograms, and on the y-axis, you have silver 109 in atograms as well. And each of these dots represents an individual nanoparticle mass that has two different isotope masses. So within one minute, we we're able to get around 350 particle events for both isotopes. And out of those 350 events, 330 were actually paired. So 330 were positive for those different isotopes. And that's shown on this dot plot distribution. And again, these are 100 nanometer silver nanoparticles. So based on previous analyses, we know that these particles are quasi spherical. So we can assume that they are spherical and then we're able to obtain the size distribution of these nanoparticles. So using this equation where D is the diameter of our nanoparticles in nanometers. We can take the cubic root of the mass of our nanoparticles, multiply that by six, divide it by pi, multiplied by rho, which is the density of silver. And in this case, the density of silver is 10.49 grams per centimeter cubed. So with this, we're able to then get the size distribution of our nanoparticles based on the dual isotope, dual uh, analyte quantification. And with this, we're able to see that our nanoparticle masses, or our nanoparticle sizes are around 96.1 uh, nanometers. Um, so this was really interesting to see is that we can now transfer our mass data to get nanoparticle size data. And so with this, yes, we have a new technique to get this nanoparticle information, but how does it compare to conventional techniques? And so here is just a comparison of our dual analyte ICPMS comparing it to transmission electron microscopy. And so again, this is the same nanoparticles that were just shown in that mass dot plot distribution, where we have an average nanoparticle size of 98.1 nanometers, plus or minus 11 nanometers. And when we look under transmission electron microscopy, with those same nanoparticles, we're getting very similar uh, quantifications of these nanoparticles, which in transmission ele electron microscopy was around 100 nanometers, as you can see here in this image as well. And so, the TEM result definitely corroborated our ICPMS method, and we're able to accurately quantify two isotopes per particle at a rate of over 300 particles per minute. And that's a lot different at, than TEM. If anyone in the audience has tried to analyze 300 particles on TEM, you know how difficult that could be. But with dual analyte ICPMS, we're able to obtain that information within one minute. And again, there's no extra image analysis that's required. There's no really sample preparation is just diluting your samples into nano pure water and running them on the mass spectrometer. So this was a great success for us. And again, we also corroborated these ICPMS results with transmission electron microscopy for the other sizes as well. So we can quantify the different, we can quantify two different isotopes within the same nanoparticle. What about two different elements within the same nanoparticle? And how can we look at bimetallic nanoparticles like those gold and silver nanoparticles, those bimetallic alloy particles with dual analyte ICPMS? And so that's the next step of this uh, talk that I'll be presenting. So conventionally, Nanoparticle composition, especially with alloys, is usually, especially in the literature, it's usually obtained with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, as shown in this image here. And energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy in combination with scanning transmission electron microscopy is essentially where you have an electron beam moving across your sample. And the way that your sample interacts with that electron beam, sometimes X-rays are emitted. Um, during that bombardment by an electron beam. And so you can characterize those characteristic energies that correspond to elemental composition in EDS with STEM. And so this is an image of our bimetallic nanoparticle systems, our model nanoparticles. In the cyan, you see the silver signal, and then in, in the red, you see gold. And in this overlay image, those signals are overlaid, and the original STEM image is shown on the far right. And so with EDS and STEM, it's a semi-quantitative method that we can obtain the composition of our nanoparticles. And so with that technique, we're able to obtain the composition of these alloy nanoparticles. These in-house synthesized alloy nanoparticles have a, about a 60% atomic 
gold composition and around a 40% atomic silver composition. However, we're only looking at eight nanoparticles and it's really difficult to make an assumption about how these particles may behave when you only look at eight nanoparticles. And with STEM and EDS, it's actually a very labor intensive method where the beam has to go over a sample multiple times to get enough signal. So again, this is even more time consuming than conventional transmission electron microscopy. So there is a real need to have a high throughput in situ way to quantify nanoparticle composition. So we optimized our ICPMS to simultaneously quantify silver and gold within bimetallic nanoparticles. And so here is a dot plot of the same nanoparticles that you saw in the previous image, where on the y-axis we have silver and on the on the on the x-axis we have silver and on the y-axis we have gold. And as you can see that this distribution is actually very heterogeneous at the single particle level. And again, this data was collected within one minute of acquisition. And within one minute, we're able to get 312 silver events, while we also got 316 gold events. And out of those events, 297 events are paired, meaning that those 297 events were positive for both gold and silver. And this is, this is the mass distribution shown below. And so this high positivity rate of both gold and silver confirmed the bimetallic nature of these alloy nanoparticles. And again, this shows how heterogeneous this distribution of bimetallic nanoparticles actually is. We we're able to get a median mass of gold of around 3,000 atograms, while the median mass of silver was around 2,000 atograms. And with this, we're able to then quantify the composition distribution um, of gold and silver for each gold and silver alloy nanoparticle. So using this equation, where you want to obtain the the, quantif the mass percent of some isotope, you take the sum of both isotopes and divide it by the mass of isotope X in this scenario. So if you're looking for the, the percent of gold, you would take the mass of gold that you measured, divide it by the total mass of gold and silver you measured and get that, multiply that by 100. And so here, you can see that we're able to get this actually very nice mass distribution of both gold and silver using this uh, uh, using this dot plot on the left. And as you can see, the average silver composition was around 40%, while the average gold composition was around 60%. And unfortunately, EDS is not able to provide such quantitative information since you're only looking in perhaps at eight nanoparticles. Sometimes it can be hard to get these low or these extremes and quantify these extremes. But again, with dual analyte ICPMS, we're able to do that. So yes, we can quantify the composition of nanoparticles, uh, but what about different types of compositions of our bimetallic nanoparticles? And so what we did is we synthesized different compositions of our gold and silver alloy nanoparticles. And as you can see on the left, we were able to get a around a 30% silver composition with a 70% gold composition and EDS was also useful in that. But again, in this EDS image, you are only able to get four nanoparticles, but with our ICPMS method, there's over 300 particles acquired within one minute. Similarly, we can also make something, a bimetallic nanoparticle that has higher silver content, around a 75% silver content with a 25% gold content. And with EDS, we're able to get similar quantitative measurements. And so, Essentially what our EDS method is doing, our STEM EDS is, it's corroborating what we're seeing in ICPMS, which is a new method to quantify our bimetallic nanoparticles. So in, since we can quantify the different compositions of bimetallic nanoparticles, the next step was, okay, we can, can we start quantifying changes in compositional ch changes in individual nanoparticles with our new technique? So the next step was to then pick an element within these bimetallic nanoparticles and start reacting it with a different chemical to see if we can remove it from that nanoparticle and quantify its removal. And so in this system, we use potassium iodide as an etching solution to remove the gold of from these bimetallic nanoparticles. And so again, we first use STEM and EDS to quantify the interaction of potassium iodide with our gold silver alloy nanoparticles. And on the left, you can see our image of our 4060 composition without any potassium iodide. Then as we increase our potassium iodide concentration, you can see that the gold 
composition starts to decrease and the silver content starts to increase as well. So this was really indicative of, again, showing that our, we're able to look at this, this reaction uh, on EDS and STEM and get a semi-quantitative understanding of how potassium iodide may be interacting with these gold, silver, alloy nanoparticles. And the most, the highest concentration that we used, we saw that there was about a 33% decrease in gold when we had the highest concentration. And so this again demonstrates the concentration dependent etching of gold from these gold, silver, alloy particles. But it's really difficult to see well, what may be the impact of silver on these particles. And these images only have two particles. So what is a potential better way to get higher resolution and a better distribution of this reaction happening? So in this bottom row, we have, our, again, our dual analyte ICPMS of these particles exposed to different potassium iodide concentrations. So as you can see, similarly, as we saw in EDS, that the gold composition started to decrease as a function of increasing potassium iodide concentration. So again, on the x-axis, you have your silver mass, and on the y, you have your gold mass. And as you can see, as you move from left to right, that the there's a decrease in events that are higher masses of gold and that that decrease of event masses also correspond to a decrease in composition of gold as well. What's also interesting to note, and this is another limitation of dual analyte ICPMS, is that as we increased our potassium iodine concentration is that our gold signal started to increase, our dissolved ion gold signal started to increase. And that's an issue because when we're doing ICPMS is that we need to have a nanoparticle signal three sigma standard deviations above that ionic signal. So as we increase our, di our dissolved ionic gold, as we're etching more of our nanoparticle away, that it actually becomes harder to measure individual gold. So in the last panel, you can see that the parent events were only 243, while the other ones were about 300 events that we were collecting. So this is indicative of one of the limitations of ICPMS that you have to be careful of that dissolved ionic background. However, we're still able to get the composition of these nanoparticles and over again, 300 particles within one minute, as opposed to these two particles that you would see in EDS STEM. So now that we're able to quantify the heterogeneity and observe the heterogeneity of this reaction, what about looking at a better distribution of how heterogeneous the reaction is for gold? So here is just a quick distribution diagram of our nanoparticles exposed to different concentrations of this potassium iodine etchant. And this distribution is based on the mass histograms that you saw in the, the mass distribution that you saw in the previous slide. So again, we have this mass percent of gold. Um, and again, as you're increasing your concentration, you are starting to see a decrease in the actual mass that's actually occupying, the mass of gold that's occupying those gold, uh, those gold silver alloy nanoparticles. And what was interesting to note is that in this, that not all the gold was actually dissolved from these particles, which could indicate some surface lattice or some passivation within the nanoparticle structure. So this technique clearly demonstrates how heterogeneous a chemical reaction, a model chemical reaction is at the single nanoparticle level. And this again has broad reaching implications for folks who may be interested in other different types of chemical reactions of nanoparticles. Um, probably catalysis and other things like that. So this was really exciting to see that we can now quantify how heterogeneous a nanoparticle reaction is at the single nanoparticle scale. And again, in C2 and with over 300 particles per minute. So the next step was the reaction between potassium iodide and gold was quickly, was occurring very quickly. So is there another type of reaction that we can perform over the duration of time to get a better understanding of how we can use this technique to quantify nanoparticle kinetics. And so I want to introduce to you this reaction that was used uh, in for the last part of this paper and the last aspect of what I'll be talking to you today about. So again, we're using our dual, our, our, our bimetallic nanoparticles. Um, we start with 55 nanometer gold nanoparticle seeds, as you can see in this TM image here. Uh, we can expose both of them. We can expose these nanoparticle seeds to equal molar amounts of gold chloride and silver nitrate in the presence of sodium citrate for 60 minutes. And then we can track how much of this dissolved gold is actually depositing onto the surface of our nanoparticles. 
and we sought to quantify the kinetics of this metal deposition on these colloidally dispersed nanoparticles with dual analyte single particle ICPMS. And so at specified time points during this chemical reaction, we would analyze this nanoparticle reaction mixture with dual analyte ICPMS to simultaneously quantify both gold and silver deposition onto our nanoparticle seeds. And the hypothesis was that due to the higher reduction potential of gold compared to silver, it's ideally, or it's assumed and known that potentially gold would deposit faster on the nanoparticles and silver leading to a faster growth rate of gold and a lower net growth rate of silver at the beginning of this alloy growth progress. So what we did is again, we used this chemical reaction and we we're able to simultaneously measure both gold and silver as a function of time. So these are waterfall plots of our, of our nanoparticle solutions. And I just wanna walk everyone through these, these waterfall plots. So on this X axis, we have the mass of gold or the mass of silver. And again, we're just measuring both at the same time. And we can measure as a function of time and that's going into the, the screen at the Z axis as a measure of time, we can measure how fast the increase of these masses are actually occurring. We can measure the frequency as well. So within one minute, you can see this teal, this teal peak here decrease. And then after one minute, you can see that there's more of an increase of these orange masses here after one minute. And we can look at the distribution of masses as a function of time. And similarly, with silver, you can see how, as a function of time, you're starting to see a more increase and more pronounced uh, masses and of higher masses as a function of time as the reaction proceeds. And at a certain rate, it starts to slow down. So this was really interesting for us to see is that we're actually able to quantify how fast these metals are actually depositing as a function of time in situ. And so with these waterfall plots, we're then able to obtain, again, our the nanoparticle composition using the former equation where we know the total mass of a nanoparticle, we can get the amount of gold and silver. And as you can see that in the beginning of this reaction on this left figure, that the mass of the, the percent of gold on the nanoparticles actually increases almost up to 70%, while the percent of silver almost decreases around to 30%. And then after some certain amount of time, this process actually starts to level off. And to confirm what we were seeing in dual analyte ICPMS was that we actually analyzed uh, this reaction mixture using UV vis spectrophotometry. So we're able to obtain the the absorption spectra of these nanoparticles as the reaction continues. And this was confirming what we were seeing in dual analyte ICPMS. So at time zero, the maximum wavelength of our nanoparticles, they're absorbing around 480, which is a nice orange color. And then after one minute of adding equal molar amounts of both gold and silver, you can see that this jumps up to over 510 nanometers in wavelength, indicating that there's a quick deposition of gold, meaning that this wavelength is shifted red. And then as time goes on, you can see that this wavelength starts to decrease and level off around 500 nanometers here. So this UV vis spectrophotometry, again, it's a batch based method, but it was confirming what we were seeing with our single particle ICPMS method. So, our next step was to then actually obtain some quantitative information about the reaction rate of this, of this, uh, of this deposition of metals. So, here, and this is the last figure I will talk about. So, here is the the reaction proceeding as a function of time and the total mass. And that may be confusing for a bit, but I hope to explain it. So the total mass, meaning that we were able to take the total mass of all the nanoparticles measured. All So this is all the nanoparticle mass within our solution. And we're able to track how much of the ionic gold and silver are leaving solution and depositing onto our nanoparticles. And so we're in picograms now. So each of these, each of these dots are the whole the sum of all the gold and silver mass that we are measuring at each time point as you can see as it increases at a certain amount of time and then it slows down so with our kinetic understanding we're able to actually see that the deposition of gold was around two times faster than that of silver and we're able to fit these dot plots with a reaction a reaction kinetics with like pseudo first order reaction kinetics and obtain this better kinetic understanding and so 
the equation is shown up at the top and we're able to get good agreement with this equation with our values here as, so, as shown with the R squared. And we're able to obtain a rate constant of around 0 0.08 minutes for gold and for silver it was around 0.13 minutes, minutes, uh, minutes to the negative one, excuse me. So the rate constants of gold depositing onto the alloy nanoparticles, they did account for an exponential growth phase followed by this plateau in mass. And so ultimately this data showed that the gold deposition was around 50% complete within five minutes, whereas the silver deposition was 50% complete around nine minutes, indicating that the reaction would be virtually complete around 15 to 20 minutes, as was observed with our UV vest spectrophotometry. So this was really exciting to see that we're able to track and quantify how much metal is leaving solution and depositing onto our nanoparticles, which could be useful in terms of potential drug release or potential uh, filtering mechanisms or other types of reactions that you could see uh, using nanoparticle or bimetallic nanoparticle systems. So I just wanna summarize uh, about our dual analyte ICPMS method. So ICPMS or single particle ICPMS enables the absolute mass quantification of individual nanoparticles. Single particle ICPMS with quadrupole mass filtering can quantify single bimetallic nanoparticles at a rate of around or even over 300 particles per minute. With dual analyte ICPMS, we can quantify the removal of one element from nanoparticles and that was shown with the potassium iodine etching experiments and we were all able to get very good agreement with conventional techniques such as EDS and STEM. We're also able to obtain reaction kinetics of metal deposition onto nanoparticles in situ while maintaining this high throughput technique or this, this method. And so if you're interested, this, this study was published in Nano Letters recently. And I advise if you're interested and want to see more and learn more that this paper is here available for anyone to learn more. And yes. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who helped out with that, particularly the Wilhelm Lab uh, with my advisor, Dr. Stefan Wilhelm, and Emmy Francek and Majud, as they were very helpful in going through the data with me, looking at TM images and analyzing ICPMS as well. And also a big thanks to Perk and Elware, especially Chatty and Ruth, who taught me everything I know about single particle ICPMS, as well as Sandy, who was very instrumental in allowing us to experiment with the software and Robert and Steve Daniels for helping us troubleshoot the collision cell. Also, thank you to the folks at OU with who helped a lot with electron microscopy. Um, and that would be Julian, Preston and Andy. They were very helpful in getting us off and running with STEM and EDS, as well as the folks who helped us with ICPMS at OU, Dr. Foster and D Stone. And the folks who were able to corroborate our dual analyte ICPMS findings with Saitoff, Caleb, and Joel, and as well as funding sources such as the National Science Foundation and OCAST as well. So with that, I would like to have, take any questions. Well, thank you, Nathan. That was a really good presentation. I, uh, I liked some of that data there. That's excellent. Thank you. All right, let me see. Start working through the uh, questions here. We did have a few that came in. Uh, just wanted to remind everyone here, I'll just take over for a second here. Just remind everyone that uh, you can still submit questions uh, through the questions pane in the web or um, in the desktop application computer when you have. All right, so without further ado, I'll skip to some of the questions. All right, so the first question is, is it important to use ammonia gas in the cell? Could I use a different gas such as methane, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> Um, so we did ammonia in our, again, in our, our experiments. Um, and there's, there's a paper about um, how different gases can affect, and they looked at helium and hydrogen, as well as a mixture of ammonia. 
And it's good to use gases that have a higher mass and that allows you to have a bigger cross-sectional area that allows your nanoparticle ion clouds to interact with ammonia or potentially methane. I think methane could work, um, but again, I think more research is needed to see that as well as oxygen as well. Um, but I, I don't I don't know why ammonia, uh, methane would not work. I think it could do to uh, potential side reactions that you'd have to consider or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, you'd have to consider other reactions as well, for sure. Um, actually, it's basically similar sort of question. Do you have to use pure ammonia or could I use a diluted form? Like, I guess they're the... Yeah. So yeah. you don't have to use pure ammonia. And the first paper that documented the transient ion particle stretching process used, I think, 10% ammonia with helium. So if you're going to use something like helium or hydrogen, you're not going to have that good peak stretching. And you might not get enough peak stretching or uh, collisions with your nanoparticle ion clouds. Um, so you'll probably have to use a higher gas flow rate than what we used with just pure ammonia. So it will just have yeah. to be balancing on that, but it's possible with a lower concentration of ammonia and, for sure. And that's what I thought too, Nathan, when I read that, I'm like, well, yeah, you could use diluted, but then you'd have to probably put more total gas in there to get the same effect, right? Definitely, yep. Yeah, yeah. so you'd probably, you might lose out on sensitivity. It's just my initial thought on that. Um, Okay, next question. Uh, well, with a comment uh, first, pairing efficiency looked great. Uh, oh, again, no, sorry, it's another question. Do you have to use a pair of one? <laughs> uh, so we'll go on to the, the next one. We, we already answered that one. Uh, okay, next question. Hi, Nathan. For nanoparticle analysis, have you ever tried the PFA microflow, or do you, are you, did you only use the aspirin um, spray chamber? Yeah, so we only use the Aspiron spray chamber in this scenario. I'm not familiar with the PFA. Well, I think I think the the question really is, did did you just use a standard, you know, you know cyclonic spray chamber with nebulizer combination? That did you have to use the Aspiron chamber? So yeah, I think one of the important aspects is that with other sample introduction systems or other spray chambers, that your transport efficiency could be low. And with, in this scenario, we are getting a transfer efficiency of 40%. So if you're able, and that allowed us to get an acquisition rate of over 300 particles per minute. So that's really important for this study in that we were able to rapidly analyze that many particles due to how efficient the samples were getting into the instrument. So if you're using the baffled cyclonic chamber, which I think has a transfer efficiency of 10%, it could be done, but yeah, your particle yeah. concentrations would have to be higher, or you'll just be getting a it's low rough. sample. Yeah, it's around 10. So maybe you just need for counting statistics, you'd need to monitor it a little bit longer. Right. Just increase the scan time longer. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, that, that's what my, my initial. Well, no, I've done a lot of single particle work. Yeah. Yeah. If it, it's it's all comes to statistics, a lot of it. So so if you have low particle concentration, you just kind of count longer. Um, um, Next question was, well, again, this is kind of on transport efficiency. Was transport efficiency affected when the universal cell was being used? Yeah, that's a great question. So we determined the transport efficiency with those polystyrene, polystyrene beads. Um, and without the collision cell, we are getting 40% transport efficiency. And with the collision cell, we are also getting 40% transpor transport efficiency. And we are able to do that by balancing the ammonia gas flow in the AFT. So if your gas flow is too high and your AFT is too low, then you could break up your nanoparticle transient ion clouds. Um, and so you really have to find balance those two things to make sure that you're getting coherent stretched distinct and single peaks and we are optimized that for each of the different um each of the different analytes that we we're looking at and we saw that the transport efficiency was 40 percent when they're optimized correctly
Excellent. Yep. Yep. Makes it makes sense. Uh, you have to optimize the AFT. Uh, you know, in a lot anything with the uh, with gases in the cell. Uh, we we determined that back in the early two thousands. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, could this next uh, question? Um, I mean, I can even answer this one. I, uh, I always thought that the quad settling time was a function of quad to quad power supply. How do you change the quad settling time when carrying out single isotope and dual isotope measurements in the same analysis? I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm sure you played with this, Nathan. But uh, I mean, when you're doing single isotope nano, it just sits on that, so there is no settling time. Settling time doesn't come into play when this this. This is more of a research area that the dual isotope, it's actually not a uh, commercial product, um, but the uh, dual isotope measurement, we do play with the settling time or adjust the settling time based on the jump or hop distance. So it depends on how many AMU you're jumping um, that the quad and associated electronics um, need certain amount of time to settle between that hop. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, it, it is adjusted. It's, I think you did mention, right, Nathan, you adjusted it manually. You optimized it for each one, right? Correct. So yeah, the, the nano application module allowed us to, once we pick an isotope, that we were able to manually adjust the quadrupole settling time. And as Aaron, you were saying that, yeah, there's a, there's a limitation to how far your isotopes can be apart. Um, and that's a really important distinction. And the quadrupole settling time was very important to balance, and it will depend on the isotope abundance that you're looking at, how far the mm -hmm. isotopes are, and how big your nanoparticles are. So that's a really important parameter that needs to definitely be fine-tuned. Yeah, yep, good point, yeah. Um, well, someone asked, how big is the cost difference between quadrupole and time of flight? <laughs> oh, I... <laughs> If you're Aaron, you're in sales. You probably can answer that better than I can. <laughs> it's definitely more for time of flight, uh, for sure. Uh, and uh, yeah. definitely, definitely more kind of bringing. Um, and can I add another point to that? I, I think with time of flight mass spectrometry, um, when we were trying to use the time of flight mass spectrometer, they're very careful of using nanoparticles. Um, just because of how many ions are hitting that time of flight detector. And Point. once those are saturated, that that's a very costly mistake. So they're a lot more delicate, but they're a lot more sensitive. Um, but with the quadrupole, it's a much more economic and cost effective technique. Um, and that just has to be very, and yeah, you can saturate your, you shouldn't too much, but you can saturate your quadrupole ICPNS and walk away and not destroy your instrument. Um, but with time of flight, it's much more costly. <laughs> and then for some of these experiments you were doing, especially when you're doing some of the, you know, growing the nanopart, learn, you know, discovering what works there, it's a lot more robust for those sorts of applications, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, definitely. I am, yeah, quadrupole mass spectrometry is very useful for that. Um, Next question would, uh, I know we're over time, but we'll, uh, you know, people can drop off there. It's all just recorded, but there's some good questions here. Um, would the parent efficiency have increased with dilution in the dissolution experiments to dilute out the background? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, that's, yeah, that definitely probably would work. Um, but then your acquisition rates so in that experiment, we kept the scan time the same for all of our samples. Um, so yeah, if we were like saying we need to collect a minimum of you know 300 paired events for all of our samples, then um, yeah, dilution would be important to reduce that ionic background. Um, and then at what point? I mean, 300 is a very arbitrary number. So at what point? At how many particles do you say until you get like a distribution? So we just kept our scan time consistent and constant, so we could just see how it would perform. But yeah, diluting is definitely important um, to reduce that ionic background for sure. Yeah, and I found that as well, Nathan. Like if you have a really high dissolved background, that's kind of the best way to at least get an accurate sizing, right? Uh, and, and count particles. Um, but you're right, you have to scan long <laughs> to go longer. Yeah. Um, and then another question, What's your pulse width of a single particle before and after? Uh, 
then after, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to reread that. What's your particle width of a single particle before and after expanding it in the MS? I'm assuming, meaning like this, the, the transient uh, ion signal time? Transient width, yeah. What, uh, oh, after you're adding uh, a gas to it, I'm guessing that's what. Yeah. So that depends but, on particle size. Um, and so you can see it in the paper, actually, in supporting information. We have the transient ion cloud signal durations of the beads with and without gas. And we also have our silver nanoparticles, those transient ion signals for all four sizes with and without the ammonia gas and AFT. Um, and with the ammonia gas and AFT, we're getting a minimum of around, I think, 1500 microseconds, so 1.5 milliseconds minimum. And then with the larger particles, we can get up to six milliseconds of transient ion signal time, which is enough for the quadrupole to switch and plenty of time for the detector to pick up as many ions as possible. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a little more broadening for sure there. All right. Um, uh, one, uh, one last question. Could this technique be applied to single cell oh, ICPMS? Yeah. So uh, stay tuned. Um, <laughs> uh, that should be an up and coming. Uh, work that you'll probably be seeing soon from our lab um, and we do have data to show that that is possible yes excellent i, I can't wait to uh, <laughs> see that that'd be great yes all right <laughs> I th any anything else uh, nathan any other comments or uh, yeah just if anyone's interested our contact information is available and we're always happy to chat with other fellow icpms enthusiasts um and so yeah, thank you for having us. That was really a great yes. time. Thank you. That was really good. There's a set of experiments that uh, I was really happy to see, uh, and the, the data looked very great. So um, thanks for doing that work. All right. Well, I know we're about 10 minutes over the hour, but that's okay. It's uh, good to listen to this. And uh, if you want to come back and, and look at the recording anytime, everyone will get an email um after i think uh, about 24 hours from now you'll get an email uh to the recording of this and um and all the contact information will be there so thank you nathan it was very great to have you and thank everyone for attending today's webinar if you have any other questions please reach out to myself or nathan or i can connect you to nathan if, if you need so uh, just reach out once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a quick survey on the presentation. We'd appreciate it if you can complete that, provide feedback on how it went. You'll also receive a follow-up email, as I said, about 24 hours, the link to the recording. So on behalf of Perk and Elmer and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day and week. Take care.